Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. If theta is the rent on gamma, for Robert Bogutsky, trading options from the long side has always been worth the inevitable pain from carrying positions during benign periods. Trained in mechanical and aerospace engineering, Rob made his way to Goldman Sachs at a time when the street was just starting to take on individuals with math and physics backgrounds. Starting on the currency options desk at Goldman, Rob would spend time as well at Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch before ultimately leading the global macro trading desk at Barclays, running a large customer and proprietary FX options book. Musing that a bachelor's degree in crowd psychology is worth more than a PhD in economics, Rob stresses that modeling architecture like Black-Scholes is important as a starting point for valuation, but we need to appreciate the limitations of models. We review a few fascinating risk events and FX derivatives that Rob traded through. Remembering how disrespected risk premium was in the early summer of 2007, for example, Rob bought vol in the Brazilian Cross, a pair in which hedge funds had piled into in order to earn the sizable interest rate differential. While difficult to carry, the market ruptures that materialized late summer as the quant quake went into full sway made this trade highly profitable. We speak as well about taking in as many data points as possible across the asset classes for clues as to what might sponsor the next risk event, a strategy Rob executed by roaming on different floors to get a feel for what colleagues were up to. Today, Rob is co-head of global trading and head of derivatives trading at Galaxy Digital, a firm focused on various businesses in the crypto landscape. In his role of pricing options on digital assets such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, Rob has plenty to say about these interesting vol surfaces and the interaction of various actors who are net sellers or net buyers of volatility. In his view, derivatives market liquidity is steadily increasing and a virtuous cycle is in place. These products will become more important as the extraordinary thrust of central bank actions are creating a broad rethink of the fiat monetary system. I really enjoyed this episode of the Alpha Exchange, and I hope you do as well. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Robert Bogutsky. He is the co-head of global trading and the head of derivative trading at Galaxy Digital. Rob, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Great to be here, Dean. Thanks a lot. I'm a huge fan of your company and your research and your views, and it's a great day to be here. Well, let's get into it. Let's share some of those views, and I'm very eager as well to have this conversation because you've got this deep background in derivatives, but you come at it from the commodities and the FX side. And now, of course, your company and you are focused on a new commodity in currency, so digital currency. But let's get uh, started with some of your career history and how you developed your passion and interest in finance and specifically derivatives. Take us back to the start and how you launched your career in the industry. So yeah, I was always somebody who liked to take things apart and learn how things worked. So I ended up attending Cornell University, where I studied mechanical and aerospace engineering. My passion from being a little kid was always aviation. And I was always an engineering, math, and physics-minded person. And I tried really hard in high school, and I managed to get myself into Cornell Engineering, a place that's still very dear to my heart. And when I was at Cornell Engineering, I did a summer internship in Belgium as an engineer for a steel company. And the best part about that internship was it made me realize I don't really think I want to be an engineer. And so I didn't really know what I was going to do when I graduated. But I read an article that was actually sent to me by by my grandfather about how the biggest investment banks in the world were coming to the engineering schools, looking to hire engineers, physics majors, and math majors to go into this new thing called derivative securities. And so I interviewed with Goldman Sachs. I interviewed with Bankers Trust. I interviewed with some of the big Wall Street houses and ended up getting a job working for a guy named Mark Spilker, who was running the currency options desk at Goldman Sachs in a division called Foreign Exchange, which was run by a gentleman by the name of Lloyd Blankfein, who eventually became the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And that's how I started my career and first got into the business. I was put on the currency options desk. And it was kind of funny how when they came up to interview me, they said, do you know anything about interest rates? I said, not really. They said, do you know anything about currency? They said, not really. And I said, I'm really bombing this interview. You know, do you ever really read the Wall Street Journal? I said, not a lot. 
They said, what have you been doing for the last year, Rob? And I said, well, I've been studying laminar and turbulent flow over wing surfaces in a wind tunnel. I said, I think that's pretty much it for Goldman Sachs. And they said, you know what? That's perfect. Here's a plane ticket to New York. Come down. We'd like to talk to you. So this was really the time, Dean, when it was quite renegade for these financial institutions to look to engineers, physicists, math people, as opposed to going to your classic business major or economics major for um, financial services. And then my career moved on from there. I ultimately left Goldman. I worked for Morgan Stanley. I eventually worked for Merrill Lynch. And my last job in traditional finance was running the global macro division at Barclays, which encompassed all of FX, commodities, emerging markets, and rates. But my home base where I started out was the foreign exchange division at Goldman Sachs. Well, you, as you got started in the industry, you mentioned a firm from yesteryear, Bankers Trust, an innovator in the early 90s, especially on the interest rate derivative side, and has its name next to one of the bigger blowups of a corporate, Gibson Greetings, back in the early 90s using structured products. And some of our conversations, what I've enjoyed talking to you about, Rob, is especially insofar as your background in physics and engineering, this concept of convexity. And sometimes it's uh, perhaps not taken seriously enough. And then sometimes perhaps the models of Wall Street, they become religion. And we think that these puzzles can all be figured out in the same way that a physics problem can be answered. And so it's some balance between taking the nonlinearities of markets seriously, but also not being too beholden to the models. So you've had your fair share of experience trading through crisis. And I was hoping perhaps just walk us through the kind of evolution of some of your thinking, big picture about derivatives and maybe highlight some of the periods where episodes of crisis or vol events were especially informative to your philosophy on derivatives and markets. What are some of those events like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And let me just back up to the beginning of your statement, which I thought literally took the words right out of my mouth and, and things that I've said to people over and over. I used to sound like a broken record at the firms that I used to work for because I was a trader and I was always a trader and I had to make decisions, real decisions on deployment of capital in a principal way as to whether or not we were going to be long something or short something, whether we were going to buy, whether we were going to sell a deal that we took the other side of, are we going to keep it? Are we going to get out of it? And I would often find myself in rooms with people with PhDs in economics telling me the euro is going to do this because of the current account and the GDP and interest rates and all these other things. And I would ultimately get to this statement that I'm about to reveal to you, which is I would tell all of these economists, look, you guys all have physics envy. (laughs) You use the word physics. So I'm going to tell you how I saw it. Physics envy. I said, look, economics is a man-made science based on a man-made construct. It's not a natural science with natural laws. There comes a point where the linear laws that you're used to applying via economic theory to the way markets behave start to fall down and break apart. Unlike physics, where the laws of physics anywhere in the universe are steadfast and are always going to hold up. If you drop a weight above the Earth's surface, I can tell you via a series of equations how it's going to accelerate, when it's going to hit, how fast it's going to be going when it hits, and what the resulting force that's going to be imparted on the floor when the weight hits the floor is. In economics, we try to apply the forces of nature to economics, and we try to apply the laws that we think truly exist. But those laws break down when you're dealing with things like human behavior, you're dealing with the dynamic of risk and greed exchanging places in people's minds. And as the old adage goes, a bachelor's degree in crowd psychology at certain points is worth far more than a PhD in economics, I think is a really boilerplate statement that underlies what exactly you're talking about, which is the concept of convexity. Convexity, to me, is about having optionality on having the right position at a market's most extenuated points. And for that reason, if you were to ask me, am I typically a long convexity trader or a short convexity trader? I've been an options trader my whole life. I would have to say hand on heart. Yes, there have been times when I've been short options and short convexity, but they're few and far between because I really believe that the ultimate outlier P&L events and gains to be had in this market are in figuring out how to be long convexity 
and just not pay the going rate of what's being charged in the market to be long that convexity, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that ultimately seems to be such an important part of managing that long option portfolio is to find a way to scratch during those inevitably long lean times where vol is low, implied vol is quite low as well. So it's difficult. I just was reading a book uh, by a gentleman, uh, Colin Lancaster, global macro guy, wrote a book called Fed Up. And he said, I hate selling vol, but sometimes the market just forces you to. I was curious if you could maybe just riff on that statement and just how someone who's managed large vol exposures over the years, what does that mean to you and how have you confronted those skinny periods of realized vol? Yeah, great question. And look, you know, to go back to your question of just talking in general about convexity and drawing from some of my personal experiences of managing large amounts of risk for big financial institutions in this market, I'd like to draw our attention to two specific events that I think would be really instructive of just how convexity can really rear its ugly head and be, if you're along it, the best P&L generator ever. And if you're short, it could literally be career ending. And I would draw the attention to 2007, when you mentioned sometimes the market forces you to sell volatility. If you look at 2007, you look at how low the VIX got, and you look at how tight credit spreads got, and you just look at how holistically disrespected risk premium got going into 2006 and 2007 before the global financial crisis. That's a great example of what that author, I think, was talking about, where sometimes you just have no choice. And I think you had people that were hanging out over the cliff edge of risk, specifically negative convexity. And we can talk about how even a linear position can be negatively convex when you're short something at 10 that can only go to zero, but is bound by infinity on the top side, which takes us into like GameStop and all those things that are topical today. But going back to say 2007 as an example, I was this guy in foreign exchange that was looking at currencies and looking at what was going on. And one example of what that author I think was talking about was when every hedge fund manager going into the summer of 2007 was doing the carry trade and doing it in the most amount of leverage that any bank's prime services division would let them get their paws on. And what they were doing in currency land was really simple that like anybody can relate to borrow a currency with a low interest rate, lend in a currency with a high interest rate. And the biggest suspect of this was the Brazil yen currency cross, where hedge fund managers were borrowing as much yen as they could get their hands on, levering it four to one and depositing in Brazil that had interest rates of 11 or 12 or 13 percent. And it was like free money, 40 percent, four to one leverage on borrowing at zero and lending. And I saw volatility just getting sold to very, very low levels. I think yen volatility, dollar yen volatility was somewhere around six. Brazil volatility was operating somewhere around 10 or 11. It was like on double digits. Maybe it was at 13 or something. And the Brazil yen cross was trading at 18, which in the universe we were in at the time, Dean, was this stratospheric vol level. It was like 18. Oh my God, the VIX trades at 12. Dollar yen trades at six, euro vol trades at five. And some hedge fund managers were coming in, some of the biggest managers you've ever heard of in the space were coming in and selling Brazil yen volatility to even add juice to the carry trade that they were already doing. It was like 40% is not enough. I want more, so I'm going to sell Brazil yen volatility. And I started picking the other side of the bet. I started saying, look, I'm just going to buy this stuff. And I got called into the office about a month later because I was bleeding money and time decay. I was losing, you know, about four or five million dollars a month. And I'm sitting there bleeding on the cross of time decay, as people say. And I literally said to the person who was running Merrill Lynch at the time, I said, look, I believe in this trade so much. I'd like to extend the risk limits and I'd like to continue to take the other side of this and build the position. Because the one thing that I did was a little bit different is I went outside of foreign exchange. I never really saw these businesses as silos. And I met with a friend of mine who traded in CDOs and traded in some of the mortgage stuff that was soon to blow up, but we didn't know it. And we walked around the marina down by Merrill Lynch. And he just handed me a piece of paper. And I looked at the piece of paper. I said, if what's on this piece of paper is truly the position out there, 
there's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars of losses on Wall Street. And all of these trades are going to have to unwind just because it's going to be a wholesale margin call. And of course, going into August of 2007 and into September, that's exactly what happened. And it actually led to what at that time was the biggest two trading days of my entire career, because I was long that convexity on the unthinkable just starting to unwind, because that's when the Bear Stearns hedge funds started to quake. And it was the canary in the coal mine of what became the global financial crisis. You've got a bunch of great stuff in there. And I'm just thinking back to that period as well. And the corollary on the equity derivative side was large hedge funds selling a variant swap, which is not just negatively convex, but exceptionally negatively convex, especially at very low strikes. And I remember a fund uh, sold S&P one month variant swap at 9.8. And it's so asymmetric in terms of the win loss ratio. And yet the realized vol turned out to be four <laughs> and they packed a generated a tight little profit. So it's interesting how the incentives get created here by what we see and what we experience now. The carry trade's working now, and so people tend to get bigger and bigger. And I wanted to just get your insights here on just the risk signals that come from certain FX pairs. And one of the things I remember quite distinctly in the early days of the crisis, maybe call it early 07, people started talking about the Icelandic krona. And on a bad day for the markets, when the VIX started to rise, this is probably by June 07, when things were starting to percolate a little bit you'd see these risk-off days be big sell-offs in the corona. And I didn't really know much about it. I was trying to figure it out. But you, I think what you're pointing to is that there are these corollaries that you can establish across markets. Sometimes you have the blinders on in your own asset class. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Tell us about sort of how you looked at the world broadly in managing FX vol. What, what were the other signals or other data points that were part of that mosaic of risk that you used? I mean, look, I love trading. I love managing risk and I love the space. And anytime I got a review, I had some positives and some negatives. But the positive was people always said, you know, I had a good nose for risk. I had a good nose for knowing when things were going to unravel. And somebody said to me, like, what's your secret? Like, why are you, you tend to have a good track record of being on the right side of these blowups. And I said, quite frankly, and it was somebody asked me this question with Barclays. I said, it's simply pressing other numbers in the elevator other than the floor that I work on. And he said, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, I go to the equity morning meeting. I go to the credit morning meeting. I go to some of the investment banking and leverage finance pipeline meetings. Because the funny thing about foreign exchange, which is really where my heart is and where I grew up, is that foreign exchange is not really an asset class that people opportunistically trade as something that they're going to express their view in. 80% of the flows going through foreign exchange are simply going through foreign exchange as the transmission mechanism for the other, what I call primary businesses in the capital markets. They're either fixed income bond deals that are moving across borders. They're either merger and acquisitions moving across borders. They're huge pension and sovereign wealth managers allocating to equities across borders. So the biggest mistake I think most foreign exchange traders make is staying in their own little silo and thinking that it's an asset class in and of itself, when actually the big picture is that it is simply a transmission mechanism by which commerce and equities, fixed income, and private equity is traveling through on planet Earth. And so the secrets, to answer your question, we're not really the secrets, but the clues and the indicators and the canaries in the coal mine of when something's going to start to really come unglued tend to be in those other asset classes. And that's what I've always relied upon to assess whether or not risk is being disrespected in terms of being priced at low levels of insurance premium. And as to when I tend to want to step in ask for my risk limits to be extended a little bit, because obviously when you buy risk premium, the only thing you can lose is the premium and start to build up a position on the thing that, as they say, four out of five dentists surveyed say is not going to happen. And that's another clue. When I go to other asset classes, for example, oil in 2013, which was another one of the biggest trades I ever made in my life. And I went down to Texas and every single oil producer, 10 out of 10 dentists surveyed said, Oil's never going through 90 ever again. We stopped our hedging program. We just took off all our hedges 
some of them said we took off all our hedges. Some of them said we canceled our hedging program. And I said, really? So in addition to E equals MC squared, Einstein also said that the law of the universe is that oil is never going below 90 ever again. Where are the 75 puts? <laughs> like, where are they? And let's buy them. <laughs> because and I remember calling back to the desk and saying, and they said, oh, those are really low. Rob, you don't want to buy those, or whatever. I said, no, no, no. I just had 10 people in Texas tell me that oil will never go below 90 ever again. And one of them was riding a mechanical bull after he said it, I need to buy the puts. <laughs> so interesting, right? Because crude by the middle of 2014, crude vol was at a near all time low, certainly a post 2000 low. And if you kind of add up all the vols, credit rates, FX equities, and then put crude in there, you'll get a an index of vol that's really even lower than pre-crisis. And a lot of that was crude. And again, it's just people seem to just forget about risk. Rob, I was hoping just, you mentioned a couple of things there in terms of FX, and it's people traveling through this market to do things as end users. A lot of corporates, for example. If you were to step back and try to give us some big picture of the supply demand universe when it comes to vol, the suppliers, the demanders, can you try to give us a Again, a big picture, 30,000 feet overview of who's utilizing vol from the long side, who's the supplier. How does that universe work in terms of finding the end price? In foreign exchange, the typical suppliers of vol typically are the corporates and are typically end user investors that are selling vol as a way to enhance yield. It's corporates basically saying, I'm happy to sell vol here because I have natural flows coming through from one country to another. So I'm happy to sell like the euro puts or the yen puts or whatever, because I sell things in Europe and I have to sell my selling euro calls or selling euro puts, whichever way it is. And I happen to not care if I get called out of risk here. No different than an equity investor who says, look, I'm long Apple stock. I have no problem selling the 150 calls and collecting some premium because if I get called out, I get the premium and happy days. I have the natural underlying position. The buyers of vol tend to really be opportunistic hedge funds that are looking to, just like myself, tend to trade from a positive convexity perspective, or at least from a wanting to risk one to make four, risk one to make five type of mindset, because that's really what they're paid to do. So the recycling of risk in the foreign exchange market tends to take place with long-term investors selling, corporate selling, and opportunistic hedge funds buying when that level gets to be too low and they look to take the other side and opportunistically position. Are there periods where that need, and maybe back to that Brazil yen trade, are there periods where that need to kind of create standstill return is creating such a wall of supply of optionality that it tends to almost be self-reinforcing and gets the market stuck where folks like you are on the long vol side and almost tripping over themselves to rehedge and you get one of these low vol cycles that itself is a function of the vol selling? Yep, absolutely. And like, look, while it would be great for me to sit here and talk on your podcast about how every single time I've bought volatility, it's been a winner. That would just not be the case. I go back to a time, I forget when it was, I think it was sometime around mid 2000s, like 2004, 2005, 2006. And you asked specifically you know, Dean, what are some of the indicators that you look at for when vol is too cheap? I told you some of them that were more qualitative, but one of the quantitative indicators I tend to look at is when the interest rate differential, vol is always looked at on an annualized basis. So when we think about interest rates, we think about annualized interest rates, and we think about volatility, we think about annualized volatility levels. One of the dead ringers for me is that when the interest rate differential between two currencies starts to approach the volatility level, i.e. Mexico interest rates are 8%, US interest rates are two, and volatility in Mexico starts to approach six, I start to analyze what's going on and really start to think about buying. And I started buying Mexico vol, I think it was sometime around 04, 05, that was being sold relentlessly by Mexico corporates and even a little bit US corporates at eight vols and seven and a half vols and seven vols. And I just sat there bleeding time decay saying, you know, this just can't persist much longer. And the fact of the matter is, it persisted way longer than I thought it was going to persist. It cost me somewhere on the order of 10 to $20 million. And 
it eventually came unglued, but you know, I had scaled back some of my position by then. So I really only kind of got back a half or three quarters of what I had spent in premium. But again, as one of the old adages goes, you and I probably know full well, the markets can remain illogical far longer than you can remain solvent. So it killed me to have to cut some of this Mexico volatility risk at six and at 5.9 when the interest rate differential was six, because it just made no sense from a value perspective. But I had to, because part of managing risk in options, whether you're long or short, or really managing risk in anything, is discipline. And I think you as a student of the macro markets understands that really well. Oftentimes, what tends to carry people out is removing discipline from their process. And even when you think you have it right, you really just have to stay disciplined and keep to the boundaries that you've set for yourself in terms of what you think is going to happen. Yeah, the equity vol equivalent of that is 2017. We had a realized vol in the S&P of 6.8. And then most remarkably, the realized vol on just the subset of down days was (laughs) 6.6. So (laughs) if markets are supposed to crash down, this was not a year for that. So much of this, Rob, especially on the FX side, is driven by central banks. What they promise, how they move, their relative stances to one another, Bring that into the fold for us in terms of your thought process and then maybe just in terms of, you know, big vol events that you've traded through and how central banks may have been a part of those. Be curious to hear hear you talk through the central bank aspect of it. Sure. Central banks, we can, I guess we can talk about the Fed a little bit, but before we go to the Fed, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about what happened with the Swiss and Euro peg breaking back in January of 2015? That would be fascinating. Yeah, that was another big vol event for me in foreign exchange. And we talked a little bit about Brazil yen when I went long in that city. But in trading, one of the things I could say after 25 years in the business is the trades you don't do are just as important as the trades you do do. And when I was managing the foreign exchange business at Barclays in New York, it was right around the spring of 2014. And if people recall, there was a wall in the exchange rate between the euro and the Swiss franc. It traded at 120. And it was because the Swiss National Bank came out and said, we are not going to let the Swiss franc appreciate anymore. We've tried to lower our interest rates. We've tried to do this. We've tried to do that. But it will just absolutely kill our economy if the Swiss franc appreciates so much. And people tend to not really understand that. But if your currency gets so expensive, that the products that you sell become so expensive to the outside world and it becomes just so darned expensive to do business with you because your currency is so expensive, that can really kill your economy. And they put a line in the sand at 120 in Euro Swiss. And I will never forget coming back from lunch one day, sometime around October ish. And I looked at the PL of the options desk and I said, wow, we went from up zero to up $3 million. How did that happen? And somebody said, oh, we did a huge trade with such and such hedge fund. They paid us for $2 billion of 105 puts, euro against the Swiss. So below the Swiss franc floor, obviously the hedge fund manager, famous storied hedge fund manager that I won't mention, but you'd all know who he is, had taken a huge bet that finally the peg was going to break. And they said, you know, and our models have this option valued at 10 basis points. And he paid us at 25 basis points. I think those were somewhere thereabouts, the numbers. And he did it on $2 billion. So, you know, we're up $3 million. And I said, guys, you're buying that back and you're buying it back right now. And they said, what do you mean? I said, look, you're buying it back. We ended up buying it back at 30. We ended up crystallizing a loss of something like $700,000, a million dollars on the trade. But it was the best decision I ever made risk management wise to say, take the $700,000 hit, buy it back, buy it back right now, and just do not participate taking the other side of that trade. And I remember literally being in the men's room and hearing these guys talk about me behind my back saying, (laughs) I can't believe him. He should just stay in his glass office, stay in his little bubble, stay in his lane. What is he doing coming out to the desk and making (laughs) micromanagement decisions and how we manage our risk or whatever? It was sort of like when you watched Ali McBeal and the toilet flushed and you realized who was listening in on the conversation. But I said, look, guys, I'm not upset that you feel this way, but I just need to explain to you how I'm seeing this. You need to realize that these option pricing models, just like the laws of economics that we were talking about earlier about, Dean, they're guideposts and they're sort of general rules, but they're not absolute rules cast in like 
stone like the laws of physics. I said, look, when an option is trading so low that it's worth 10 basis points, it can be one of two things. It can be because it's worth 10 basis points, like maybe it's worth nine, maybe it's worth 11, we don't know. It can also mean that there's a 99% chance it's worth zero, and there's a 1% chance it's worth a boatload. And unless you can quantify for me what a boatload is, how big a boatload could be, and what the boundary condition is on a boatload, I don't really like to be short convexity where I don't know the boundaries of how much I'm risking. And something like this just had no boundary condition. It's a word that's borrowed from my mechanical engineering studies called the boundary condition, which means stress the system to the boundary condition. And if it doesn't break, fine. If it does, you have to stress it to the boundary condition to see if the system works. And there was no boundary condition on this. And I made them buy it back. And it just so happened that in January 2015, I'll never forget, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning to get a glass of water in the middle of the night. And I looked at my screen and I saw the Euro Swiss exchange rate that was at 120 for like years, trading at 0.8, literally 40% lower. And this is something that that option that was sold, Dean, at 105 was sold at like five vols and it just moved 40%. And I said, thank God we bought this thing back. But again, discipline, boundary conditions, knowing your maximum downside. And in my career, the trades that I advocated not doing were just as important and career defining and defining in my own internal assessment of how I manage risk as the trades that I did do, if that makes sense. It's a great analysis of the promises that central banks hold out to markets. And I just remember it was days before, and I'm thinking three days before, Philip Hildebrand had said, no, we're good. That peg is money good. And three days later, it was not. I would say sometimes central banks just get overwhelmed by markets, Turkey, Iceland, but here was a choice. And it's one of the choices we've come across. And I think in the aftermath of that break, we saw how many people were lurking about the carry trade. It was incredible to see the losses that were consumed by essentially selling that two or three or four or five vol. It was amazing. It was shocking. And I'll just say that, again, if you drop the weight and it heads towards the floor, you can use physics to predict all of that. But to your point on central banks, when a hand mysteriously comes out and stops the weight from hitting the floor, obviously applying an equal and opposite force to stop it, it's pretty much man-made and at the discretion of some other outside entity, in this case, a central bank, which is something they do all the time. We're just picking the Swiss National Bank as an example. You really don't want to be short optionality on something like that. And in FX, that happens all the time with central banks, where they literally come in to force something, and they can do it for a really long time. I mean, the Swiss National Bank said, we will do this for as long as we had to, until they didn't. Amazing. Well, let's use that as a chance to pivot to what you're doing now, the work at Galaxy Digital, its mission. And I would love to learn more about what you're seeing in the realm of the derivatives markets on Bitcoin, Ethereum. So tell us about your transition. Tell us about Galaxy Digital, and we'll have plenty to talk about in this new vol asset class that you're overseeing. Yeah. So I joined Galaxy Digital in January of this year. I've been here for just under five months now. Galaxy Digital was founded by somebody that I consider a mentor, a friend, and really one of my first bosses at Goldman Sachs. When I was at Goldman Sachs, New York, I got sent out to Hong Kong. I was maybe a year in the business. I'd learned to trade options. We had some staffing issues in Hong Kong with people moving around. And it was actually Lloyd Blankfein that called me into his office and said, you're going out to Hong Kong for a little while. I said, how long's a little while? He said, oh, don't worry about it. Just get on the plane. So I got on the plane. I went out to Hong Kong. And there was a really interesting character out there by the name of Michael Novogratz, who at the time was in his early 30s. He was just a great energy of a guy to be around. And sitting on that trading floor where everything was a lot smaller and you had access to senior management, I got to really learn from him and look at his views of markets and how he learns things and how he studies things and thinks about things. And he founded this company, Galaxy Digital, 20 years, 25 years after I first met him in Hong Kong out of his family office, where he, in 2012, made the bold move to buy Bitcoin and buy Ethereum when everybody just thought it was a party trick or a joke. But he actually really saw it as a potentially new financial ecosystem, a new financial technology, 
and even a completely new macro asset class that eventually the biggest macro traders in the world would come to as yet another class in the four main asset classes that we affectionately call macro. And he really believed in it, becoming that fifth asset class. And he spun out Galaxy Digital out of his family office. It's public on the Toronto Stock Exchange and is starting to look at potentially publicly listing here in the US. And the mantra of Galaxy Digital is it's the bridge from traditional finance into crypto. So as crypto becomes this accepted asset class for macro expression in the portfolios of hedge fund managers, insurance companies, pension managers, Galaxy Digital's mission is to literally be that bridge. And the way that Mike's done it in terms of building the company has been to hire people like myself, who are kind of in our mid, late 40s, 50s, whatever, who have the experience in the traditional financial world, coupled with really young, energetic people that are very tech savvy, looking at this new transmission mechanism, this new asset class and this new financial technology and put them together on a trading floor that I'm sitting here staring at right now. It looks exactly like the trading floors I grew up on at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and literally just slamming those two worlds together and being the trusted entity that traditional finance players will see as the go-to place to get into the space. As you're observing the infrastructure that is so far in place to trade Bitcoin and then specifically to trade derivatives around Bitcoin, I was hoping you could share with us what you're seeing so far, what opportunities you see, what challenges may still be ahead of us. What's your observation so far in terms of the trading infrastructure? I have to say it was, I started looking at the asset class truly about a little over a year ago when the coronavirus hit and in March, Bitcoin took a leg lower and Mike was out there screaming from the rooftops, you know, you'll never get a chance to buy it here ever again at 6,000 and 7,000. And you know, he, he was right, you know, because we're sitting here at 56, 57,000. But I did a little bit of consulting for an asset manager before Mike called me up and heard I was running around, sniffing around in the space and hired me as the co-head of trading here and the head of derivatives. I have to say, when I sat down in the seat, Dean, in January, I was expecting things to be way more nascent, way more undeveloped, just way more not well put together than they were. And I think when you and I were first introduced by our mutual friend, Barry Knapp, the first thing I told you was, I'm surprised at how developed this market is. There's all these other altcoins and cryptocurrencies, but speaking to Bitcoin and Ethereum specifically, there's a real mature vol market in this stuff. There's a real legitimate volatility surface in this stuff. We run a book that I always joke around with people when I talk to them in traditional finance, when they ask that exact question you just asked me, what's it like, Rob? I say, I kind of feel like I got in like the stainless steel DeLorean in Back to the Future <laughs> and went back 23, 24 years to my days of trading emerging market options in Asia and emerging market options in South America at the beginning of 2000. It's really the same type of market that's just developing much more earnestly and much more rapidly than that market developed. So I would say if I had to tell your podcast listeners what's like the one blanket statement of crypto coming from traditional finance, I use what I just have coined the, the rule of 10, which is everything scales by 10. The volatility is 10 times higher. The notional sizes are 10 times smaller. And by that, I mean, when we price an option on $50 million of Bitcoin, because we do that almost weekly and we price amounts like 25 million all the time, it feels like pricing 250 million or $500 million worth of Mexican peso or Brazil or Thai bot or whatever. So the volatility operates at a factor of 10 times higher. The sizes operate 10 times lower. And even the time periods that people are looking at for optionality are even shrunk by a factor of 10. The longest you really see anybody think in this space right now is like three months. Like 90% of what we're trading in our options and ball book is June on in to today, which is May 7th. When you price three month, it feels like you're pricing like one year yen or Mexico. When somebody asks you for September or December, which is like six and nine months, I feel like I'm pricing medium term yen or equity ball out three, four or five years. But the market's there and people are trading it 
And the other thing that I would say that is shockingly mature in this market that I learned like within the first week that I sat down was we're starting to see really good, healthy risk recycling, which goes back to another question you were asking about earlier in this podcast, which was, where's the supply? Where's the demand? And I talked about how the conveyor belt of corporate selling volatility and hedge funds buying volatility, well, that already exists here in the Bitcoin and Ethereum mature vol spaces. We have people who are long Bitcoin for a long period of time selling volatility. We have people who are looking to enhance yield and put together structured products selling volatility. And then we have traditional hedge fund managers through their family offices or dedicated crypto opportunistic hedge funds coming in and buying that volatility. So not only do we have well-established and tabulated vol surfaces and markets and skews and smiles, but we're also starting to see the beginnings of the green shoots of recycling of risk. And Galaxy's mission is to really stand at the convergence of all of that. And I have to say, you know, it's been a really fun, intellectually interesting and inspiring space to be in in the last five months. That is exactly where I was going to go. And I think that's where it would seem to really hold some promise that you've got folks that are doing trades for different economic objectives. You've got a vol that's clearly monetizable, both from the long side and the short side. That's what makes it so interesting. The other thing, and just would love to get your thoughts on this, is I look at skew in Bitcoin. I look at even more accentuated skew in Ethereum. You've got that positive call skew. Your at the money is lower than your upside vol. And I would just posit that any asset that demonstrates that is a growing asset from a liquidity standpoint. It's just an interesting thing to trade. And I'm curious, just when you look at the vol surface, does it remind you of anything in FX or other asset classes? How are you thinking about the shape of the vol surface? Yeah, it does actually a little bit. If I had to say like getting out of my DeLorean back in 1999, which is what I feel like I've done in the last five months, I look at Bitcoin and Ethereum it's shocking how it may as well be Brazil and Mexico in the early 2000s, or it may as well be the old dollar mark currency pair, which became the euro, but the Deutschmark and the yen in the late 80s. I always want to tell people, look, it reminds me of FX in the mid 90s. And it's a self-serving statement because I came out of Cornell in 1994 and the market was actually much more developed than this space is now in G10. So for me, it's a lot more like the emerging markets when I first started assigning the yen and euro books to other traders at Merrill Lynch, and I decided to take on trading Latin America myself. It really, really, really reminds me of that. And so you ask an interesting question where it's, and it kind of gets us a little more into the existential concept of things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But when you say call skew, it's interesting because a lot of equity people say, okay, when the price of something goes up, that's the call side. As an FX person, I always think of it from both the dollar side and the asset side. And so for me, the way I've had to kind of trick my brain into understanding this call skew in Bitcoin and Ethereum that you've highlighted, Dean, is I'm like, the light bulb went off a few weeks into this where I said, oh my God, a call on Bitcoin, just like when you say a call on the end is a put on the dollar. So I actually think of the skew as actually being almost correctly priced and anticipated because Bitcoin is this proxy for the debasement of the dollar for a lot of people who are buying options. And a Bitcoin call is a dollar put. So people are really looking at it in crypto land where they're kind of starting to like think in crypto, think in Bitcoin, think in Ethereum. And they're starting to actually look at these options as puts on the dollar where the dollar's the asset and the world that they're living in is Bitcoin-based and Ethereum-based, which if you step back and think about it, is quite interesting. It's a great point. When you think about, again, the steps that you would need to see to further promote that healthy growth of liquidity that we've seen in other asset classes, I saw that there was a trade on the BitVol index. So it's basically the VIX of Bitcoin. And there was a transaction done, basically a call spread on BitVol. So it's sort of like buying a call spread on the VIX. But in Bitcoin, there was a variant swap on Bitcoin uh, about, uh, I think, two years ago. What's the growth in liquidity required to support some of those more second order type derivative products? How do you see that developing? I see that developing in pretty short order, actually, because 
again, using my rule of 10 that I'm going to borrow again, it is like watching the movie that I watched and experienced over 25 years in the eventual evolution of the FX market in like 10 times fast forward. I always add a little bit of humor to my discussions with clients and stuff. So I know my audience and somebody who's in their late forties, like I am, I'm like, it's like watching fast times at Ridgemont <laughs> high at 10 X fast forward on the DVD player. And everybody just starts laughing in the room. And usually that's another one of my strategies with clients, add a little humor in and it'll go a long way. And they just start laughing. I'm like, you know, we're going to get to the part where Spicoli orders the pizza, like really quickly, <laughs> a lot faster than we watched it back in the eighties. <laughs> and so look, I think that you're starting to see that because as I told you, the market is more developed than I thought it was going to be. And I think by around the fall or the winter of this year going into 2022, you are going to see that kind of VIX of Bitcoin actually be traded a bit more. And in order for it to be traded a bit more, I think you need two things. I think you need steadier volumes through the option market and a little bit more diversification of venue. Right now, there's like a couple of exchanges that are really dominant in where all the options transactions both price off of and exchange risk. But I think that that's going to start happening. You see some of our competitors that are buying up exchanges or they're developing their own exchanges and they're buying up strategic entities that are going to help them supposedly build option exchanges. So a little more liquidity, Dean, coupled with a little more diversification of trading venue. And I think you're going to start to see like the VIX of crypto a lot quicker than you think. Well, just running with that diversification word, but using it a little bit differently, as investors, we are struggling to find diversifiers in the portfolio. For years and years, maybe 40 of years, owning duration was a great diversifier, almost a positive carry hedge, which seems to be running out of steam here as central banks may be up against the limits with which they can lower rates. It doesn't feel like rates are going anywhere anytime soon. And so folks are really trying to find that portfolio construction. And so I was hoping you could just share some of your views, your analysis of Bitcoin in a portfolio, its correlation properties. How should people think about it from the long-term portfolio construction standpoint? Yeah, no, great question. I've thought a lot about that. Some people have mistaken people operating in the crypto spaces, people with the tinfoil hat living in like a missile silo in South Dakota who say, you know, the world's going to end and I own crypto and down with the establishment and the whole thing. But it's really not that, you know, we spent a lot of time in this podcast being talking about options, talking about options in mature asset classes like FX and equities. And now we're talking about options on something like Bitcoin. I really do see Bitcoin in and of itself as an option. In other words, like the whole thing is an option. And the reason I say that is because Look at what we learned from like, say something like GameStop. We learned about the negative convexity, which basically means curvature of something that we always think of as linear, a stock price. But when you go short GameStop at 15, we know that the max you can make is $15 if it goes to zero. And the most you can lose is actually infinity, which some people thought had boundary conditions on it of, oh, GameStop can't go above 40, but it went to like 500. And Bitcoin, the funny thing about Bitcoin is that it's still like in the first, second or third inning of the game and has not even realized its true potential in what you just asked, which is its place in portfolio construction. And that portfolio construction, to talk about it, I'll draw the attention to people running a surplus. Who runs a surplus? Corporations like Tesla and Facebook run surpluses and Google run surpluses. Billionaire family offices run surpluses, pensions run surpluses. And I think that if you think of just Bitcoin itself as an option, the way I think of it is this. I think of it as just to divert for a second. There was a stock called Corning that I really wanted to buy and really liked, and it was trading at $60. And before the dot com collapse, when everything went down to zero and Corning went to five, I wanted to buy the 60 calls on Corning that expired in six months for $5. And I didn't buy them, thank goodness, because the dot-com thing happened and everything went to zero. But eventually I took a look at my favorite stock Corning and I saw that they had $3 billion of capital on their balance sheet. 
they were burning capital at a rate of a half a billion dollars per year. And I viewed buying the stock at where it was $7. I said, this is like buying a zero call with an expiration date of 10 to 12 years because they had $6 billion on their balance. I'm sorry, they had $3 billion on their balance sheet and they had a half a billion dollars of burn rate. So it was like a six year call struck at zero. And I said, well, if I was happy to buy the six month 60 calls for $6, I better love buying the six year zero calls for $70. And that to me is what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin right now, you can look at all of the bank research and all of the stuff that's out there in chat rooms where people say, oh, I think it's worth 100,000. I think it's worth 250,000. But what Bitcoin is, is it's this thing that's a proxy for inflation or debasement of currency by central banks that's currently right now trading at $57,000. And you can either view it that way or you can view it the way I sort of view it, which is a call struck at zero with not a six year expiration date, but no expiration date that happens to be worth $57,000 that may be worth some number between $25,000 and $2.5 million and who knows. And so when I talk to people who are running surpluses, let's take for example, the many family offices that are trying to preserve the surplus of a billion dollars plus of the principal of the family office has charted them with protecting. I say, how can you not add one or 2% of your portfolio to this when your job, your fiduciary duty is to protect the surplus of this big wealthy person against inflation or against currency debasement? You're never going to allocate 20 or 30% of your portfolio to options, but would you ever take 1% of the net worth and allocate it to a two-year or three-year S&P call option? Sure you would. So why wouldn't you allocate one or two percent or even three percent of the portfolio to this thing that is really an option struck at zero with no expiration date that currently costs 57 or 60 or 70 thousand dollars, wherever it happens to be, that could have an expected probability value somewhere between 25 or 50 thousand dollars and upwards of two million dollars. And anytime I get pushback on that, the next thing I ask them is. If you're managing a billion dollar family office, do you own any gold? And they say, yeah, we've got about 3% or 4% in gold. I said, okay, so you do. Have you ever touched the gold? Have you ever seen the gold? Have you ever physically been to where the gold is and like held it in your hand? Do you even know if it exists or where it is? And they're like, well, no, I haven't. I'm like, okay, so you haven't gone down in the vaults of UBS and held the bar of gold. So you have this thing called Bitcoin, which exists in digital format. You self-admit that you have gold as one of your proxies for debasement of currency. You see the characteristics of Bitcoin, and it seems like your only problem with it is that you can't see it, touch it, and it's just not a thing. But you've had gold for decades, and you just admitted to me that you've never seen it or touched it or held it in your hand. How do you not see this the same way? And then you overlay the positive convexity attributes of Bitcoin that I just described in terms of the zero call with no expiration date. And I think it makes a very, very compelling case for people that are chartered with safeguarding surpluses against the effect of inflation and currency debasement as adding this to their portfolio as a real asset class. I think you frame that exceptionally well. The portfolio construction challenge right now is to find those positive skewed assets and to play what if. You've got to really let your imagination run wild in some ways because we are potentially in a regime shift. We're seeing, obviously, nearly unprecedented behavior by the central banks with interest rates stuck where they are. And so that search for positively skewed assets is an important one. And I think you do a great job of laying that out. Yeah. And I would just add by and kind of end by saying this, Dean, the interesting thing about Bitcoin, and I was talking to our head of research over here, Alex, Thorne, about it yesterday. He said, once upon a time, or even very recently, it was really only the most sophisticated investors that had access to financial instruments that could insure their portfolio against currency debasement or inflation if they chose to add that view to their mixture. It was really only like billionaire family offices, corporations, hedge fund managers that had access to those types of instruments. And Bitcoin kind of is this thing now that, as Alex puts it, the everyday person 
the common man or common woman can decide and make a conscious decision to add this to their portfolio, however little it is, but it's everything to them, and take this view and take this bet as an individual without having to entrust that some big asset manager or some big ETF or some big financial advisor is going to do it for them. So it really is democratizing the decision of people to be skeptical about things like central banks and government outside forces coming into leading to the debasement of the currency and do it for themselves. And that's why I think it's a pretty special product. Well, we are going to leave it there. We cover a lot of ground and really appreciate you taking the time today, Rob. I thank you for being a guest on the Alpha Exchange. Thank you very much, Dean. It was an honor to be uh, in this discussion with you over the last hour, and I really appreciate your time as well. Thanks for listening to the Alpha Exchange. Before we go, I wanted to share with you an inspirational investment symposium I'm hosting on May 11th and 12th on behalf of MacroMinds, the foundation I launched in 2018 in order to raise money for nonprofits that focus on helping improve educational opportunities for children in the New York area. Our initiative is based on two primary ideas. First, educational shortfall for families is self-reinforcing. One statistic, the children of college-educated parents are seven times as likely to go to college as are those whose parents did not finish high school. Working together, we can help push back against this cycle. The second idea behind MacroMinds is that the community of finance professionals is at its best when we engage together on the many difficult questions out there. Disinflation, crowded trades, monetary policy, cryptocurrencies, and the cost of hedging are just a few of these. Set against these uncertainties, what are the considerations most relevant to portfolio construction? What's the next big thing in finance and markets? On May 11th and 12th, these important topics will be explored. I couldn't be more excited to bring to you such accomplished market professionals who are offering their time and providing their insights. I hope that you will consider both attending and sponsoring the event. More on MacroMinds and the symposium can be found on our webpage, macrominds.org. On behalf of our partner charities, I sincerely thank you for your support. Thank you.